Well, hello, and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I've been inspired to share with you one of the greatest gifts I've ever received. And I'm not lying about that. One of the greatest gifts I ever received. It came from my sister, and she gave it to me this weekend. And no, it wasn't a special occasion. And then again, just getting together with family in person, you know, albeit socially distant and outside during one of the coldest months of the year, can be considered a special occasion. But I'm going to tell you more about it in a minute. And before I get to it, and believe me, this is a very emotional gift that she gave me. I wanted to share with you two things that happened over the past week. And the first is that, you know, for the first time since March, since our pandemic began, um, I, uh, I went back to church. And it was a very emotional experience. Now, uh, for context, a couple of weeks ago, I took a walk with my friend, John, John Kennedy, uh, no relation, by the way. And uh, like me, he's he's very involved in our in our parish, which is St. Leo's in Stanford. And in, in the early days of the pandemic, he and I worked together to have our pastor, you know, start recording weekend masses and, and make them available for streaming so that you know, the parishioners can maintain some sense of connection with the parish. Now, you know, our, our bishop, Bishop Caggiano, ha- has been streaming masses, and, and it's great to see the bishop's mashes, but uh, mashes. <laughs> More on mash in a minute, by the way. But uh, no, it's it's great to see that. But, but, but you know, you want a connection. You want to maintain some kind of connection with your local parish. And to be honest, if I'm being honest, and I'll be honest, uh, it, it really is no replacement for for the real thing. And that's not a knock on the production quality of of our of our weekend mass recordings. Um, the setup is great. It's now multi camera. Uh, the audio is fantastic, very clear. But but what's really missing is that sense of community. And you really just don't get it on a live stream. So I I you know a couple of weeks ago I, I took a walk with John. He's in addition to being a parishioner, he's, he's one of my neighbors. And I knew that he had started to go, he started going back to church when, when church is open. I think that was like in late, later part of the summer. And, um, you know, I, I held off, I held off on doing it. And while we're walking, I wanted to get a sense from him on, you know, what, what kind of safety measures were in place, right? Because it's one thing to read about them in, in emails from the parish. It's another to actually pick someone's brain who's He's actually got feet on the street, so to speak. And when we're walking, you know, he's telling me that, hey, you know, the, the, the parish is is following all safety guidelines to a T. You know, everyone has to have a reservation and they do that so that, you know, that, that they are very strict on the number of people they're allowing in. Um, every two pews are, are blocked off. Um, there's only three people allowed in a pew, you know, in, in one part of the pew, then the middle, then, then, then the other part. And masks have to be on. There's no singing, which, uh, you know, right there could be a benefit. I don't know. <laughs> it certainly cuts down on mass time. But, um, you know, when I thought about it and, I, you know, he's, he's telling me this and I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I think I'm taking more of a risk going into a crowded grocery store or a crowded uh, retail store. Um, so I wanted to to kind of give it a try. And and I did this this past weekend. And I'll, I'll be honest, I I wasn't really prepared for how emotional of an experience that was going to be. You know, I, I got into my assigned pew. We had, those are assigned, um, just a few minutes before uh, the mass began. And, and I was, I'll tell you, I was overwhelmed with emotion. You know, I didn't realize how much I missed it. And, you know, being Catholic is is very much a part of my identity. And it's not something I talk about a lot, but I, I don't hide it either. Um, and, uh, you know, all this is to say that that was a, a, a highlight of my weekend and, and, and a very emotional part of my weekend. So another thing to talk about <laughs> to juxtapose it, um, my son came home from college this weekend and that was fantastic. I love seeing him and he needed, he needed a break. So I, I picked him up on Friday. It, it was great to have him home. And on Saturday night, he wanted to watch a movie together, you know, as as a family. So my context, my wife's home, my daughter, his sister, you know, they're triplets. She's actually home this semester living with us, um, you know, doing school remotely. And and he's home. Our, our third daughter, our second daughter, but third child is is away on campus. So she was not with us, but he wanted to watch a movie. So we decided that even though we both saw this film, um, we were going to rewatch a new comedy 
called Barb and Star Go to Vista Del Mar. And if you have not seen it, now the movie's not for everyone. I found it to be hilarious. Um, my wife stayed awake for for most of it, which should tell you something. Uh, that means it's good. And um, <laughs> But at the end of the movie, we're watching. It's probably about 20 minutes left to go at this point. Um, <laughs> our dog, our 14-year-old golden retriever, and now she always barks when she has to go out. Always, you know, but she decides to get up and leave the room and she walks into the mud room and um, she drops a deuce right at the door. And and uh, let me tell you this, it gave new meaning to the term mud room or at least underscored maybe why we call it the mud room. I don't know. Never knew why we called it the mud room. Now I know. Now, mind you, we didn't see her in action, but the smell wafted in just as Barb and Star were facing sudden death. And and little did I know, <laughs> I was facing sudden death of my own when I walked into the mudroom and just saw the disaster. I mean, it looked like a Jackson Pollock painting just on the floor. And <laughs> it was so bad. I mean, it was so bad. My daughter proclaimed, I don't know what I'm going to do when I have kids because I just can't handle that. And, and oh my God, if she only knew. If she only knew. One day I tallied up the diapers that I had changed Myself that day, 27, 27 diapers. I mean, their their bedroom smelled like Jesus. I can't even tell you what it smelled like. I mean, it was it was terrible um, just back in those days. But but, you know, nothing, nothing phases me anymore. You know, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe their bedroom smelled like R. Kelly lived there. I, I but nothing phases me anymore with regards to that kind of stuff. So I cleaned it up. But but the damage had been done. Nobody wanted to finish watching the movie after that. So uh, those are the highs and lows of my weekend. You know, the highs going back to mass, having my son home, you know, having some laughs over a movie, the lows cleaning up, you know, a uh, a Jackson Pollock style painting of defecation by my 14 year old golden retriever. Um, but but uh, but there's another high to talk about here. Um, so so uh, here it is. And this is what I was teasing at, at, at the top of this. You know, my son was home. He wanted to see his Aunt Mia. Everyone loves Aunt Mia. We haven't seen Aunt Mia in a while. He wants to see his Auntie Mia. So um, what do I do? Uh, I call my Aunt Mia. I invite us over um, <laughs> because that's what one does during a pandemic. Uh, so, his, so his sister and I uh, invited ourselves over. We go over. We got to hang out for a bit. But while we're there, she told me that she found something. And I'm like, what did you find? She's like, well, these are some letters that you had written your grandparents a long time ago. And um, that was something I used to do. I used to write letters to my grandparents, especially after we moved from Florida to Connecticut back in 83. They stayed behind in Florida. They lived in Pompano Beach and they weren't moving. Um, And uh, and so she hands me the stack of letters. You know, there's like four letters in there, four letters to my grandparents. There's actually one letter to my parents. We're all I'll talk about that in a bit, too. But um, you know, just like I wasn't prepared for those emotions I experienced when going back into church, you know, after almost a year being away, I was not ready <laughs> for how I'd feel after, you know, uh, viewing these letters. I mean, these some of these letters, you know, one of them could be 40 years old, <laughs> 40 years old. Um, you know, now, in, in, in fairness, in one envelope, there wasn't a letter. There was just a single dollar bill. And uh, I'll, I'll post a picture of this dollar. Actually, I'll post a picture of all these letters on, on the Uncorking a Story website so you can actually see them because you need to see them. But in one, there was a single dollar bill, which was from a series of dollars printed in 1977. It's right there on the front. Um, now, some of you young people may not uh, know what this dollar is because <laughs> it looks different than our money now. Um But uh, anyway, I I do remember there's a story behind this dollar. So whenever my grandmother would send me a letter in the mail, it was always for some kind of special occasion or if I didn't feel well. It was like my birthday or Christmas and her card would always be accompanied with cash. I mean, grandma was always good for I'm not talking about, you know, wads of cash. I'm talking about a dollar bill here, you know, five dollars there. And one time and this is when we were still living in Florida because I remember I can I can see the scene vividly. You, you might challenge this, you know, because I was probably four years old at the time. You know, this was 77. I was born in 74. I was three to four years old. Um, 
one time, so I, I I could see myself in the kitchen of 841 Northwest 67th Avenue, right? I can see myself in that kitchen. And my mother was sending my grandmother and you know, her mom a get well card because she wasn't feeling well. And she asked me to sign it. And of course, I was going to sign it. I would do anything for, for my grandmother, you know. But, but but when my mom wasn't looking, I went into her wallet and I took out a dollar and I put that in the card thinking it would make her feel better, you know. So that dollar um, is the dollar that that was in one of the envelopes that my sister gave me. And I remember this story so well because, you know, my grandmother kept, you know, the, that dollar in her bureau in the spare bedroom of her apartment. And we, we, we laugh about it quite a bit. Um, you know, even even after my grandmother died, my mother would tell the story about how I sent <laughs> her a dollar and, um, you know, it's one of these stories that like always, you know, I, I get a little teared up thinking about it, but but it always puts a smile on our faces, you know, and, and and I remember grandma asked me, she's like, why did you send me a dollar? And I'm like, I thought it would make you feel better. She would always send me money whenever whenever I didn't feel well. So I thought it would make her feel better. Um, So just, just getting into the letters now, I mean, the letters, you know, just rereading them, you know, I'm a researcher by trade. So I look for patterns and things. And, and these letters have a pattern to them. They have a theme. And, you know, in, in one of the themes is I was just always telling my grandparents how much I miss them and, and how much, um, you know, they would always like a company. They would always like follow up like a visit they, they, they just had. Right. So so they would come. They'd spend a week with us or so. And then they go back home and then I'd write a letter just to say, hey, we miss you. Thank you for coming. That kind of thing. And um, they were you know, the, the letters I was writing always said, you know, wish the visit could have lasted longer or, you know, how I couldn't wait to come and visit them. And I know two of these were written around Halloween because, you know, uh, I was wishing my grandparents a happy Halloween in the letters. Um, and and, and the, so the fact that they're written around Halloween just reminds me of a story. My grandmother was a seamstress. Now, if the, if the name Oleg Cassini means anything to you, um, uh, my grandmother was in business with him. And, and, and the, the, or the story goes in, in my family. My grandmother taught him everything he knew, which I kind of believe she was very, very talented. And, you know, being as as she was a woman and this is probably in the 30s. Um, yeah, yeah, probably the 30s. You know, she she wasn't certainly wasn't getting the credit for her talents. Right. Um, so that that kind of stinks. But anyway, so she was a seamstress. And in around 1980, uh, the Empire Strikes Back comes out. It comes out in May of 1980. And, and I wanted to be that October. I wanted to be Chewbacca for Halloween. Now, why Chewbacca? Well, Jim was going to be Luke Skywalker. Uh, Jim is my twin brother, so I couldn't be Luke. Um, my friend Mario, uh, Mario Turco, um, had to be Han Solo um, because that's what he said and whatever he said goes. So we've got Luke covered. We've got Han covered. Um, I can't be R2-D2 or C-3PO because, you know, I wanted to be a, a real thing, you know? <laughs> Which this is going to sound funny. Is Chewbacca a real thing? I don't know, but he was made of organic matter. So, hey, I'll be Chewbacca. That was that was my um, that was my pick. And every Chewbacca costume. I mean, look, this is the 80s, right? Early 80s. They're all made out of vinyl. You know, and they didn't look like Chewbacca. My grandmother, you know, when we bought the costume. She's like, this doesn't look like Chewbacca. I'm like, I, you know, Wookiees aren't real, Grandma. Although maybe I didn't know that at the time. But she said, you know, I'm going to make you a Chewbacca costume. So being the seamstress that she is, we go to the fabric store. She finds some Wookiee looking fabric and she makes me, I swear to God, head to toe, zip up Chewbacca costume. And, um, you know, it was awesome. It was awesome. The, the, the unawesome thing, of course, was we were in South Florida and uh, it was very warm that October. And this I was basically wearing a fur coat, you know, <laughs> I could have been Joe Namath. I don't know. Or Kid Rock, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was a little hot. So it was a lot, I had it like a heat stroke while trick-or-treating. So that, that's my little trick-or-treat story. Um, but the next letter um, that I had in there, also, you know, written on loose leaf. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll put an image of, of the all of these letters um, in, in the post on uncorkingastory.com. Uh, it was written probably in March of 97 because, you know, like the first one, it was written to both my grandmother and grandfather, and he died in August of 87. So I knew it was before then because he was still alive. And I wished her a happy birthday. 
and a happy St. Patrick's Day. So that must have been March. And I, and I know that it was 87 because I talk about in this letter, I talk about having a paper route and I only got that paper route in 87. So there, there you have it. So this one was written in March of 87. And in it, I, I tell her that I'm excited that we'd have a few more days to spend in Florida because we were traveling in the air. Those are my words. We're traveling in the air. I don't know why I didn't simplify it just by saying we were flying, but I said we're traveling in the air. And, um, you know, uh, <laughs> that was a treat because we always drove to Florida. And while we had many fun adventures on those drives, um, two days in the car uh, is, is a lot. Uh, again, a lot of adventures, a lot of stories from from those times. I will save those stories for another time. But uh, but I in that letter, I also I also tell her what I'm going to do with the money from that paper route. And, and what I was going to do was buy a new Walkman. I was going to buy a new Sony Walkman because my old one broke. And um, yeah, I mean, music was very important to me. I needed a Walkman. I mean, I couldn't not have a Walkman. Um, but, but I do remember how, how the old one broke and, 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 um, I'll tell you it's because I let my twin brother, Jimmy, uh, use it. And let's just say he was not the most careful person when it came to anything, specifically my things. I mean, this kid used to throw my action figures up into the ceiling fan just to see them get disembodied, you know, but I'll tell you this, the original star Wars action figures made by Kenner, the original ones, they fared pretty well. You know, they would not break in the ceiling fan. Um, you know, very well-made uh, toys. However, the MASH action figures, and this is where MASH comes into play, the MASH action figures that we had, uh, not very well-made. You know, poor Father Mulcahy, you know, uh, of course, immortalized by actor William Christopher in the series MASH. He did not stand a chance <laughs> against the blades of um, my parents' ceiling fan. You know, I remember Jimmy threw him up into the fan and his head wound up in the glass of water that I was drinking and, and, and I, who am I getting? It probably wasn't water. It definitely was Coca-Cola, but the, uh, the mash action figures, the GI Joe's, the original GI, not the original, you know, four foot figures, but the, the little toy figures, uh, they didn't fare so well either. Um, you know, I remember Cobra commanders, arms and, and legs were flying all over the house. Ah, oh, boy, I'm, I'm still bitter, I guess about him breaking my toys. Um, but I also, in that letter, in that same letter in March of uh, 90, uh, 97, March of 87, I, I reference having to have three teeth pulled. And uh, Dr. Mean, if you're listening, I still have nightmares about you. Now, the next two letters I know were written after my grandfather died. And um, I knew this because they were only addressed to my grandmother. And, and of course, I, I tell her how much I miss her, how empty her house felt without her. Again, these were written right on the heels of her, her kind of leaving. Um, so she had something to read when she got back. And, um, but these two letters are different because they're typed. You know, we had gotten our first home computer probably back in 87 and my handwriting, you know, my mother always called a chicken scratch and so did sister Peter Marie. Um, you know, so I decided to start typing everything. And uh, in the second of these letters, I'm complaining about how cold it is in Connecticut. <laughs> and I compare us to Eskimos. And uh, and I tell her, you know, I don't know how we do it. You know, I survive. I barely survive. And um, I'll tell you what, though, you know, I, I can tolerate the cold now. But I uh, honest to God, I would still prefer to be in Florida during the winter months. Um, no, no doubt about it. My wife doesn't get it. You know, she doesn't understand that. But but she's not a native Floridian. I guess I'll just cut her some slack there. Um, so let's get to the final letter in the stack. So this final letter um, of five, the final of five letters was not addressed to my grandmother, but it was it was addressed to my grandmother, my grandmother it was addressed to my mother and father. Now, they're living in her apartment um, back then. So I was a senior. This was written during the fall of my senior year. So this would be the fall of 95. And uh, she actually my, my grandmother died my senior year in high school. So this is about, you know, uh, probably a little under four years. You know, this she, she died in May of, of uh, 92. So this was uh, the fall of 95. So this is, you know, three or three or so years afterwards. And um, let's see. Uh, you know, I, I, I talked to them about, um, well, I brag, right? I brag about not receiving any grades lower than an A so far that semester. Um, well, there you go. How, how cool is that? Uh, I also talk about the classes I'd be taking in the spring. One of them was psychological tests and measurements. I called that out in the letter. And, you know, that class was very special to me because I, I formed a very close bond with the professor um, who was actually retired. He's Professor Emeritus. His name is Sam Wintrial. And 
And he's the guy, I know I've mentioned this before, but I'd, I'd meet him before every class. I'd carry his bag so he could smoke his pipe on the way to class. And, and he shared a lot of wisdom on those walks. And, you know, I, really, that's a very special memory I have. Um, you know, I, I kind of wish I had written Tuesdays with Maury. <laughs> but, um, you know, in that letter, I tell them how uh, my parents, how I had interviews with some graduate schools. And, and you know, I, I was planning on getting my Ph.D. after graduating. And um, but, but, you know, in that letter, I also admit that I, I didn't know if I could handle another five to seven years of school and, and be broke until at least I was 27. And, um, you know, I didn't I, I wound up not pursuing that that degree. And, and it is um, it is a regret. I mean, it is something I've always wrestled with. And, you know, even rereading this letter that I wrote to them, you know, makes me realize that I, I, I do have regrets over over not getting my doctorate. And I remember right after I got married, I actually reconnected with with that old professor, Sam Wichreal. Um, So I had been out of school. Let's say I got married in 99. I left college in 96. God, I didn't waste much time. Um, so this is probably call it around 2000. I had this conversation with Sam and it was spurred because I had written him a letter. Um, I had written him a letter just to check in on him. And, uh, you know, I think I probably shared that I was kind of struggling in you know, adjusting to life in the business world. I wasn't, you know, didn't really feel like it was for me. And he encouraged me when he called me. Um, he encouraged me to, you know, not give up on a dream, uh, that dream I had of become a, psych- a psychologist. You know, he, he told me that, you know, he knew of people who who tried their hat in the business world only to go back and get their advanced degree. And it, it was really just his way of suggesting that it wasn't too late for me. You know, he was trying to be encouraging. He wasn't trying to be prescriptive. He was trying to be encouraging. Um, but here we go at the end of the letter to my parents, this is where it really comes full circle, right? So I wish them a happy Halloween, (laughs) just like I did in the first letters that I was, you know, telling, you know, talking about with my grandmother, you know, Chewbacca, remember that? Um, so I wish them a happy Halloween and, um, (laughs) here's where it comes fuller circle in the postscript. I tell them not to forget to go to church for all saints day. And this is what I write, because the fires of hell await those who skip church and those who leave church early because golf is on. Now, my father would call that jab, Michael being Michael. And, he, you know, you see, my, my mother always reminded me to go to church, right? Every weekend, she'd call me, don't forget to go to church, Michael, when I was at school. And I did. I spent a lot of time at St. Thomas Aquinas at the University of Connecticut. Um, but so I couldn't resist giving her a reminder in the letter, right? And I, I couldn't you know, resist poking, you know, a little fun at my dad because, you know, he would always take us to four o'clock mass. Um, this is me and my brothers. Uh, he would always take us to four o'clock mass and we'd leave right after communion. We'd go to St. Bridget's on Newfield Avenue in Stamford because Father John gave a short homily and uh, we'd leave right after communion so he could catch a few more holes of whatever golf tournament was. on. <laughs> but I need to underscore something. I need to underscore how chickens come home to roost, because in that letter, I also asked for help with rent money as well as spending money. And this weekend, I get a text from my daughter, Gracie, who's away at Sacred Heart University here in Connecticut. And she was asking me to send her a few bucks to go out to dinner with her friends. So, yes, the chickens have come home to roost uh, and life comes full circle, right? Now, I started this off by teasing that my sister had, you know, given me one of the greatest gifts I had ever received. And I wasn't over exaggerating about that. These letters to me are priceless. You know, it strikes me, though, that that letter writing is a lost art. And I actually feel sad that I haven't written a hard copy, you know, letter to my parents, a physical letter to my parents in ages. And, you know, my kids haven't either, you know. Um, And I'd like to change that. You know, I'd love for my kids one day to receive a stack of letters um, that their grandparents felt was important enough to keep and save and eventually go back to the sender. Um, So here's a parting thought. So, you know, reaching out and touching somebody, you know, used to mean picking up the phone and calling them. Today, it means FaceTiming them or, you know, maybe just shooting them a text message. But but how about this? How about instead of doing that, you know, why not write an old fashioned letter? you know, fold it into, you know, fold it and put it in an envelope, you know, put a stamp on it, address it and send it by mail. You know, it's going to take a lot longer to get to that recipient, you know, than the email or the text. But 
But you know what? I I, I think some things some things are just worth waiting for.